Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Ton uh, Venoven. Yes, I hope that's not the worst pronunciation. Sort of. Yeah, okay, you, you tell me properly what it is. Um, so I'm just going to briefly read you a little thing, and then I'm just going to say a couple of words about, about Ton. But, um, but, but thank you for joining us um, from the Netherlands this evening, so, which is really nice. Um, so Ton is a former uh, chief government advisor on infrastructure to the Dutch government from 2008 to 2012. Uh, during his time in government, he advised on sustainability of infrastructure, urban and regional planning. Uh, prior to this, he was professor of architectural history and theory at Eindhoven University of Technology, where his design work focused on the pedestrian city of tomorrow. Alongside his work as an architect and urban designer, uh, Ton is an international consultant for smart micro city and healthy city, integrated planning, multimodal mobile networks and transit oriented development. Among his clients are national and international governmental organizations and foundations. Um, sustainability is in Ton's DNA ever since the publication of Limits to Growth, which is a book you should look at and, and it is in the library, uh, which was 1972. He has made a point um, he made it a point in both his professional and private life to contribute to a sustainable, equitable world in which we can all thrive. Um, his latest focus is on biodiversity and nature and inclusive design. Um, well, the other night I was listening to uh, the radio, and for the young people, the radio is something you can, it's quite a small device, you buy it, you don't have to log in, it's free. Um, and uh, I heard this interesting guy talking about um, the 15-minute city, and I thought, this guy sounds good. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and it was you. So, that was, so I thought, well, that's good. He's coming in on Thursday. So, um, so thanks very much for that. I really enjoyed that. And that's available on... You can log in, go to the BBC Sounds and listen to... It's, on a, it's a show called uh, People Fixing the World, which is a really nice series of programmes. But, um, but thank you so much for joining us this evening. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I will <clears throat> uh, try to tell something about circularity in our uh, profession. Uh, everybody's talking about a circular economy and uh, I, I do not claim to have all the answers of the circular economy because it's uh, very much under development and uh, we uh, we think about it, we do things, uh, we uh, operate at an urban level and at an architectural level. I can show some uh, good results, I can show some bad results, but uh, I want to share my experiences with you, so uh, hopefully you learn something about it. Uh, this is um, a picture from a design that we made in a, a design research. Um, by the Dutch government, uh, funded by the Dutch government and the big cities in the Netherlands. And it was about, uh, uh, please think about the cities of tomorrow, 2050, 2070. Uh, that was the scope. And we, had, uh, we did it for one year with an interdisciplinary team. And we had a lot of master classes with scientific institutes in the Netherlands that told us about, uh, okay, this needs to change. Uh, please can you uh, process that in your design and that needs to change. So what you see here, for example, is a wetland in a, in a city in Rotterdam. Uh, Rotterdam is six meters below sea level and uh, the water management system is really uh, in a very poor condition. And uh, one of the solutions would be to repair this water system and it is possible because there is an abundance of asphalt and roads in, the, in this part of the city. So we can simply remove one road and replace it by a wetland. And of course, uh, there's much more to see. I will go through some of the aspects uh, of this study, but everything that I say is inspired also by this study. Uh, short overview of what we did. This is a project uh, we built in Amsterdam with a green facade and a green roof. That's a very early example of nature-inclusive design in the Netherlands. 
this is a recent design master plan for the city of Wenzhou in uh, China that had uh, big difficulties also with uh, wetlands uh, but also with deforestation and uh, the city is growing like hell needed to have a business model for the economy uh, so there we also uh, developed a sustainable master plan. This is a project that I've been working on for the past two years which is a station area development in the north of the Netherlands in uh, Alkmaar and it includes uh, not only this uh, station but also a mobility hub that uh, creates room for uh, private cars, for uh, car sharing systems, uh, bus terminal, etc. and is um, largely a car free area. This is um, another uh, design we recently made for climate adaptation in the city of Shenzhen. And this is currently under construction as a mixed-use project in uh, Amsterdam opposite the station. Uh, this is the station. I have to show it also for the people who are looking at the streaming. So it's here, the station, and this is our project, two buildings with um, social housing, affordable housing, right next to the station. Uh, for example, the rent for one of the apartments is 140 square meters for uh, 1,050 euros per month. So it's uh, quite extreme. Uh, and it's largely also due to the policy of Amsterdam, which is almost a communist uh, policy to uh, promote affordable housing. But it also is uh, water neutral. Uh, it harvests the rainwater, stores it on the roof, as green roofs, everything that you expect from a contemporary building. This is a project we work on in the city of Eindhoven. Um, and there we work, this is a part, this uh, center picture is a part of the project. And here we try to uh, reuse all kinds of materials that we uh, harvest from this building. So we look at, uh, with, a, with a company, we look at the beams, the trusses, the wood, and uh, those elements uh, we recycle. And it's not downcycling, but really upcycling. So this was a small introduction to the kind of projects uh, I do. It's uh, infrastructure, urban planning, and architecture. And I like very much to have the crossover knowledge of all these different uh, professions. Um, this is basically what we all agree on that should be the uh, targets uh, that we share all over the world, the sustainable development goals. Um, it's nice that we have this overview of what we want, uh, what we aim for, but um, it's also a very difficult how to deal with it, with this, how to turn it into action. So there is one uh, picture that um, the Stockholm Resilience Center made. It's this picture where the uh, SDGs are reorganized in a biosphere, basically an urban layer and an economic uh, layer. And if you think about it like that, it becomes much more uh, um, much easier to deal with this. Now there are accountants that are looking for ways to uh, calculate uh, how companies perform in sustainability. Normally you have the accountancy report of any company and it uh, tells you uh, we produced so much and we made so much profit. But this goes much further. It calculates not only the financial and the manufactured capital, but also the, in, the change in intellectual capital, human capital, social capital, and natural capital. So if you make a huge profit, but you have a very bad uh, result in human capital, it decreases, then you know this is not really a sustainable company. The, the reason why this kind of accountancy, is, uh, this kind of reporting is developed 
is there is so much greenwashing in the world. And now that uh, the big, um, uh, like the EU and also the uh, United States and probably also the UK, uh, they invest a lot in uh, sustainable growth. So there is a lot of uh, necessity to um, account to, to check this by proper reporting. And here you can see these uh, six capitals, it's called the six capitals approach, uh, how they influence the, uh, how they are influenced by the business model. The business model can be a business, can also be a government, an, a nation, uh, the UK. Uh, here it's measured what comes in, then you have your business activities, and then you have an outcome. And uh, here, this is the business model, but this is what you account on. And these six capitals are related to these uh, SDGs. It's really cru uh, interesting. I, I would advise you to look at uh, the um, website when you Google for um, SDGs and six capitals. You come and find this. And there is a full report behind it, so you can go through all the details. This um, uh, picture probably you all know is uh, by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, it's about uh, the principle of circularity. And it distinguishes two elements. One is the, um, the, the technical materials, and the other is the biological materials. Very good uh, scheme, very complete. If you do it in the right way, you have hardly any landfill or energy uh, recovery from incineration, but um, you have to do it in the right way. What we see now is that there is a lot of theory going on how to enhance the circular economy. And they all focus on the large cycles, the global cycles. Like, uh, you do not see a city here. You do not see a city here. It's extremely abstract uh, how it's written. You have, to, um, you have to reduce emissions. You have to minimize uh, incineration, etc. But how you do it, how you can do it, yeah, here it says reduce by design. But how many containers are necessary for the global cycles? Nobody tells you. Um, how can you organize reuse and reduce at the local level? Uh, can you do that? That's the important question. So one of the things what you see here is a scheme by TNO in the Netherlands. Um, currently, logistics in the city, also in London, is very um, uh, chaotic. Like every business has its own trucks and delivery systems, and they uh, crisscross the city, cause a lot of emissions, uh, a lot of problems. Many uh, trucks are empty, half empty, uh, three quarter empty, and uh, it's no use. Here, uh, there is an optimized scheme where you have uh, chain mobility where you bring um, in a multimodal way by ship, by train, by airplane, by truck to a mobility hub and that you distribute over the country uh, to smaller hubs and from there uh, with electric delivery and with uh, bicycles uh, you can deliver it to the home. So this way, if you organize uh, logistics in this way, um, it's uh, easier to have the, uh, to harvest the remaining value of waste, for example. Um, it will become clearer when I go on. Here you see a scheme that we developed for a challenge for the Dutch government uh, already a couple of years ago. That was for 2070. Uh, you see how, how we developed a vision that these hubs could also become the core of the um, uh, mobility structure in the Netherlands. So all these corridors are combined multimodal corridors with uh, highways plus train uh, plus canals. And uh, if you make the hubs at the right points, 
you can uh, switch the cargo from the truck to the ship, from the ship to the train, etc. And if that way you organize the uh, mobility in this most efficient way, uh, then it also means that probably the cities will, um, people will move to those places because that's where most jobs are. Uh, see like who, how everybody in the UK is moving towards London because that's where the jobs are. In the Netherlands we have a polycentric um, city, a polycentric uh, uh, conurbation. This is Amsterdam, Utrecht, Rotterdam, The Hague. So it's like uh, no city is bigger than one million people. But with this system you can create an alternative for uh, mainly private car uh, mobility. That also means that if people uh, move towards those places, it becomes much easier to create uh, nature reserves, la much larger nature reserves uh, in other parts which are less densely populated. This whole part, the blue part, is below sea level and with current uh, estimations um, maybe this century one and a half meter higher uh, sea level, but maybe also five and a half meters. Um, it's becoming quite tricky for the west of the Netherlands what we will do with that. So saving on CO2, creating an example for the rest of the world how to fight uh, climate change, that's really a battle of survival for, for us. And uh, this uh, development is an example of that. So around these hubs you can expect that you develop transit oriented development which will create a more sustainable and connected urban environment and a competitive del delta which is also economically sound. We did this uh, study later for the Dutch government uh, where they asked us, can you do a study about the hubs? Because we find out that the national uh, highway network uh, no longer can accommodate all the cars. And uh, we need to find alternatives. And the cities are pushing the cars out. So there has to be one, uh, some sort of solution how we can uh, accommodate the mobility demand, but at the same time, um, make it possible for cities to become much healthier with much less cars. So we de developed this um, hub system where the smallest hub is, uh, is in the neighborhood, at the neighborhood level. That's a yellow one here. The black circle is the ring road and then the yellow, that's the neighborhood hubs. Uh, the city center hub is in the middle, that's the train station with everything. And then you have the purple uh, and all these, uh, the hierarchy of hubs that makes the whole system work. Now, if we go back to this, uh, uh, this uh, scheme by Ellen MacArthur, what, what, we, what we focus on as urban planners and architects is on this red box. Because if you talk about uh, that cascading is so important, for example, um, I have um, too much heat. I, I have an industry and I have too much heat. I put it in hot water, but I cannot uh, move it very far because then the hot water becomes cold. So the distance is extremely important to keep the value in that uh, thing. If you have something, if you have waste which uh, maybe uh, represent a very tiny uh, value. If all that value gets lost in transportation, you don't have anything left. So transportation and uh, remaining value are very much connected. So here we are looking at uh, how can we use heat from the sewage system? Uh, how can we use the gas, the biogas, uh, from a neighborhood? How can we produce the energy, uh, the, sun, the, su the sun energy uh, in the neighborhood for the people who live there? 
and also how can we maintain materials? How can we harvest materials or repair things? This is all taking place in the neighborhood. And it's also small transportation in the neighborhood. Look at Marlebone. You can walk. You can walk to here, to there, to there. So if we put everything in that neighborhood, uh, then we can develop a local economy that can uh, take care of these small uh, circles, cycles. And then, of course, the uh, larger industries, they will take care of uh, the circularity at a higher level. When we look at uh, cities, that's the big question. How are you going to make that uh, come true? Um, that's why we developed this uh, scheme of four layers. Uh, we, uh, if you compare it to the scheme that I showed of the SEGs from Stockholm, uh, this is the bio layer. So that's uh, where, you have to, where we have to repair the ecosystem. That's where we have to take care there is no heat stress, that there are enough plants that we can collect the rainwater, uh, harvest the rainwater, keep it in the soil so we can use it when it's a six months dry period. This is the first thing we have to take care of in urban planning. The second is the green mobility framework. That's um, there we start with, okay, how much can we do with uh, walking and cycling? And how should we compose the city to optimize the use of walking and cycling? Sh can we make uh, micro factories in the neighborhood? Can we, how, what can we do? It's everything which you can do which is accessible for pedestrians makes the, uh, makes the neighborhood thrive. Then um, the mixed-use microcity, that's not the mobility, but if you have organized the ecological system, the mobility framework, then you can start talking about, okay, what kind of life does a neighborhood have? How, many, how inclusive is the neighborhood? Uh, is it for all ages? Uh, can you, uh, do you have communities that organize themselves to uh, create a local economy? And then at the largest level, uh, inclusive economic growth. Um, is your economic activity uh, uh, hurting the capitals in other places? Like if you have H&M and you have your clothes produced in Shenyang, that's not really sustainable. So the kind of uh, export that you want to make in your neighborhood, in your city, should be sustainable in itself. So here we look at uh, an example from the Wenzhou plan that I showed before, uh, how we tackled this green mobility framework. This is the road map, and we said, okay, let's make a hierarchy in that, where we try to create these uh, one square kilometer neighborhoods that are uh, almost car free. And if you, if you zoom in on, the, on this area, you see that uh, this is partly existing, uh, the networks are existing, but parked cars are everywhere. Asphalt is everywhere, concrete is everywhere. So uh, if you look at uh, how you can develop that, then one of the main um, possibilities is to change the traffic system. So here we apply these uh, different layers. Uh, the first we say we have to repair the wetland system. So that's the ecological layer. Uh, we also introduce green patches of green in the neighborhoods. Then we have the green mobility framework which means that we have these hubs that where you uh, arrive by car or by bus or by metro, it doesn't matter. Uh, after that, you are always pedestrian. And that means uh, you have to walk maximum five minutes from where you arrive to where you live or where you work. And this, in, this is a very interesting uh, walk 
because that's where you encounter other people, where you see what other activities are taking place. And look here in London uh, at uh, Marlebone, uh, that neighborhood is beginning to look a bit like that, but it's a bit posh neighborhood. This is more uh, for everybody, more inclusive. And then uh, regarding land use and morphology, of course, uh, that defines, uh, combined with the uh, facilities, the kind of neighborhood that you are developing. And what is very important is that you have uh, buildings of all ages, that you have people of all ages, uh, people of all education levels, because um, if you have people of all education levels, it means that it's easier to organize the circular economy. Because if you have a tailor that repairs your clothes, it's better than when you have another uh, lawyer uh, because they cannot repair clothes. So it's really important to have this ecosystem within your uh, neighborhood. And then you get something like this, because uh, some buildings are worn out. Uh, we create these hubs. It's, it's very abstract, uh, but uh, I hope you get the idea that uh, this is what we're aiming for. Now, this is, uh, these are two drawings from uh, a different study for the city of the future uh, in Rotterdam, Alexander. And there, it's the same problem. It's the same problem all over the world. What used to be a garden city is now an asphalt city. And the asphalt city has lots of parked cars. And trucks can come everywhere. Delivery services come everywhere. So the idea is in the future, we will create these villages, urban villages, that are car-free, mainly car-free, and uh, that way create much more room for interaction and for uh, quality of life. And also, what is very important, by adding green, uh, you create the possibility that you have evaporation uh, in the area, that you have uh, animal life, your birds, insects. Uh, you don't get uh, pests and plagues because the ecosystem is in balance. Uh, the, uh, if there are too many uh, insects, the birds eat them. Uh, and the bats, you also have bats. So uh, that's very important uh, principle. Get rid of the cars. Not for everything, but these first five minutes walking. Then what we also found out here is that uh, we want to create this uh, city of proximity, uh, which, which means uh, what do you do at the national level? There was a question by the ministry. What should we do at the national level to uh, stimulate uh, circular economy? And then we said, well, why don't you create a proximity label? Everybody knows the energy label, A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. And uh, we said, OK, let's introduce a proximity label. Um, if you have energy nearby, that's uh, very good. If you have mobility uh, nearby, uh, walking, economy nearby, everything nearby, gives you the best score on the, um, on the proximity label. And that could also translate in lower taxes. And uh, that means that a neighborhood which doesn't perform well um, should uh, repair its act. You can see what can happen if uh, people meet in the neighborhood. Um, we're even talking about uh, local coins that you have a coin in your neighborhood, could be also a couple of neighborhoods uh, where you are stimulated to buy in your own neighborhood, to exchange, so I, I use a bit of your energy while you're on holiday, or your PV on your roof, I use that. Um, and how do we pay? Uh, maybe with a local coin, can also be in other ways, but that uh, interaction will also stimulate the development of a community. And of course, also in your country, uh, you're working on this. Building community wealth is very important. Uh, currently, 
our society is organized like that, that if, you, if we all work hard, then in the end the shareholders take the money. And that ends up with Jeff Bezos. So uh, how can we turn that around? Uh, we have to find a way to keep the money in the community and then uh, create this wealth in the community. So then I pay the tailor and the tailor is happy. So that uh, system, that goes back to this uh, six capitals approach. There are many uh, different approaches how to create this uh, uh, public finance for the future we want. That's the book. Uh, if you create very complex uh, neighborhoods with all kinds of activities, um, it's not a bad idea to also create a community host. And here you can see such a, a community host can be a robot, it can also be a person or an organization. Um, but that can connect, for example, um, hospitality for new inhabitants, uh, or can organize logistics, uh, security, uh, you can create an energy corporation where everybody can become a shareholder in the energy corporation, maintenance can be organized, events, um, so the local economy and also the mobility can all be organized by the neighborhood. That would save an immense amount of money and keep that money uh, for the local economy. So that's the theory. Now I have two uh, remaining projects that I want to show you um, where I cannot really say uh, this is all fully according to this uh, theory, but uh, there are aspects in these projects that, uh, that uh, are really um, trying to work on these four layers. So the first layer being the uh, ecosystem, the green ecosystem the second layer, the mobility system, the third layer, the uh, vibrant community, and the fifth, fourth layer, the inclusive economy. A Olympic Aquatic Center in Paris. I was, uh, Monday, I was uh, in, the, um, in Paris for the first uh, poll. Uh, it is here, uh, across uh, Stade de France. This is Stade de France. Um, here's the Seine. And this will be the Olympic Village. And this is the only uh, new building that will remain after the Olympics. Uh, Paris won the Oli Olympics. The bid was uh, uh, produced in the same period as the climate agreements of Paris. And in that same uh, political uh, situation, they developed this, the most sustainable uh, games. And by saying, OK, we use existing infrastructure only this one building will be new. And the, it, after that, it was tender, there was a competition. It took us two years to uh, battle, to fight against MAD and MVRDV. Um, and in the end, we won the competition. And one of the requirements was to make a minimum 50% of the structure in wood. And uh, we did that uh, also. Uh, so there are um, social uh, returns, uh, very strong social returns program. We uh, employ the uh, people from Saint-Denis, which is the poorest uh, region in uh, France. Uh, they, are, they will be employed as teachers, as uh, security people. Uh, we, we reuse materials from the neighborhood. They are collected by kids from the local schools. Um, and we make an extremely compact building uh, whereby we can plant trees in the same plot where uh, other competitors had the whole building. So this is the project. Uh, I have to say uh, one of the parts of the commission was to connect uh, the new building with the Stade de France with a pedestrian bridge um, which is also part of the uh, mobility scheme. Uh, the idea is that this neighborhood uh, will become a 15-minute city, like uh, the ambition of uh, Paris. It will be a walkable uh, neighborhood where people uh, can, uh, can just enjoy uh, public space. 
So here you see the bridge, which is also yet, uh, already under construction, and you see the building there. This is in the background, you see the Stade de France. So the ramp is going up, uh, so it can cross the uh, A1, and uh, the lower part of the building is all concrete, and above that is all uh, wood. And of course, the lower part contains the swimming pools and things like that. So um, the, this part um, is much easier and more durable to keep it in wood. You see that uh, there's a lot of uh, playground uh, playing opportunities around the building, but also a lot of space for uh, green. This is the interior. I will tell you about the uh, structure. Here you see the difference between the concrete part with an 18 meter pool and uh, the uh, wooden part above. There are, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, this is the biggest urban uh, solar farm in, uh, in France. So that's on the roof. And this is the big, uh, the big swimming pool uh, with a movable floor and movable walls. So you can subdivide it in three uh, swimming pools of 25 meters and one of 50 meters. Uh, this is the diving pool. Um, there will be water polo, so it's a multifunctional uh, pool. But what you can also see is the, um, uh, yeah, the recreational pool and the education pool there. And here you see the configuration during the Olympics with this uh, separating wall. Um, but of course you can uh, play with that in all kinds of co configurations. And this is the, this whole part is under the ramp. So you see how extremely compact this building is. The structure is like this. We have uh, a roof that is um, uh, suspended. Uh, so it's, it's a hanging roof with columns on the sides and uh, tie rods that keep the columns down. And let me see, uh, yeah, here you can see it. Here you see the principle. So these are the, the columns in wood and this is the hanging roof and that spans 90 meters and it's only 50 centimeters thick. So 50 centimeters by 20 centimeters and that 90 meters long. And this is uh, really incredible that it's possible. Um, but we invented this uh, structure because normally uh, when you have tribunes on both sides, tribune here and a tribune there, um, normal, the normal way to do it is to make a roof in this line. And that would mean that uh, during this whole uh, life cycle of this building, let's say 50 years, that you have to condition all the air, which is at 28 degrees Celsius, uh, very high humidity, you have to condition that all the time, uh, instead of in this structure, you uh, really seriously reduce the, um, the amount of air. Also, you reduce the uh, amount of material because you use it in the most uh, profitable way by, um, by using it uh, as a tensile stru structure. So then you get, in the end, you get this. Here are the uh, tie rods. Uh, they keep the, the uh, roof down. Uh, otherwise, if they wouldn't be there, the, the roof would collapse, this part would go down. And, um, yeah, that's it. So, how do you make something like this? 
Well, I'm not an uh, engineer myself. I'm an architect, urban planner. So for this, we work together with, uh, we team up with uh, SBP, Schleich Bergman Partners. That's a worldwide company that has a lot of engineers. And they elaborate all these uh, details, the stresses. And then there is another company that makes it. So I can tell you that the wood for this, um, for this structure comes from the Vosch, from the, for, yeah, I don't know the English word, Vogesen. Uh, it's in France, anyway. And from Finland. So two European sources where the wood comes from, partially um, uh, Douglas, mostly Douglas. Okay, on the left, you see the, um, the entire element. And you see also here, there is a connection with the concrete uh, part that comes from the floor. <coughs> and here you see all the, uh, the joint. Uh, here you see all the steel that is needed for that joint and also the, uh, the amount of holes to bolt the wood uh, together with the joint. So in the, this is the end image of the, of the joint. Uh, then uh, the connection to the floor is like this. Uh, you have this um, element that um, makes it possible for the roof to move because uh, the calculations showed that the roof will move just a little bit, just enough, so you need to have such a flexible uh, joint. That will look like this. So this is uh, an endscape uh, uh, still. Uh, here you have the uh, wooden column, and this is the joint. And then uh, in the background, you see the, the swimming pool. Last project, uh, the platform in Utrecht. It's entirely different. It's this project here. Um, Utrecht is a small town, relatively small town, 400,000 inhabitants. It's growing quite rapidly. It's in the center of the country. But to give you an impression, uh, this is the countryside. And this is the old town here. So uh, people were really angry for many years about uh, concrete jungle uh, that was built here in the 60s. And after a lot of debates, um, there was a new plan to create a new station and also new buildings here around, and especially on the other side, to bridge the gap with the uh, other part of uh, Utrecht. So it looks like this. Um, here it is, and what you can see is uh, this is the station. This is a new uh, metro line that uh, goes under, the, under this building, uh, which is a station for the metro line that connects directly to the uh, university campus. Um, also, there are buses under the building that uh, drive here, so they also stop here. So it's extremely uh, complicated location. Um, but it's a very interesting location if you live there, because when you live there within five minutes walking, uh, this is what you can find. You have all the shops in the area, you have all the facilities in the area. Uh, there are nice parks around. So if you live here, you, are, uh, you just jump in the train, you're in the center of Rotterdam, you're in the center of Amsterdam, in the center of The Hague, uh, no problem at all. So this is very wanted uh, location, and uh, we won the competition to build this project. Uh, one of the uh, elements of this project was uh, the uh, green ambition of the, of the city of Utrecht. This is, these are the old uh, fortresses of the city and with a canal, uh, which was destroyed uh, after uh, in the 60s, um, highway was built, the shortest highway of the Netherlands. I think it's like uh, one kilometer. 
with the ambition to move further, but it was stopped in the 70s by the hippies who protested against uh, the highway. And after all these years, uh, the new development of the station area included the reconstruction of the canal here. So under those circumstances, we were pushed to make uh, as green as possible building uh, in this area. And what is important if you want to make a green building and make it nature inclusive is that you create stepping stones for animals to go from one place to the other. So uh, along this uh, canal and then jump, jump, jump until here and then hopefully cross. There is a bridge with uh, trees on it uh, that crosses to the other side. For some animals it's easier, like birds, for some other it's uh, more difficult. We made this uh, plan for all the different gardens at different levels in the building. And here you see uh, the principle. So um, you have the, the roofs on different levels. Uh, we had to step back because uh, people living opposite this building were afraid that the building would take away a lot of uh, their light. Uh, and they also asked for green roofs, so that was a good match. Uh, and then we created uh, the different levels uh, of green in the building. Uh, what we wanted to uh, achieve is a nature-inclusive building, and after uh, one month, we already had a bee colony uh, in the courtyard here. So that's uh, the picture of the bee colony. What you can see here also is that uh, under the building there's a, uh, there is a connection to the train station. Under the building, the Uithof line, the metro, uh, a biggest uh, bicycle parking of uh, Europe, of the world, under this uh, square, and uh, pedestrian access and taxis. So I show you some of the pictures. This is the entrance. Uh, where you have a glimpse of the uh, metro station, but also of the street where the taxis are. There's barely enough space um, to, to have two escalators. Uh, there's only, only one, which is very slim, plus a stair. And that's the only way. It was the only remaining part of this uh, building. But green directly at the entrance. Then uh, we go up with uh, green. We go up to a courtyard and a bridge over it. And you see the cantilevering building because uh, the people living next door wanted to have the light. This is uh, one of the results, the terrace for people living here. We have 201 uh, apartments and uh, business uh, spaces. And this is the roof, especially last year during the corona lockdown, there were many parties here on the roof because the building was opened in uh, uh, May last year. People are really happy there. They have nice uh, homes. And this is how it was before uh, I told you about the concrete jungle that the station area was. This, is, this building is still existing, also buildings on this side, but uh, this location, uh, the bus station, that is the location for our building. And basically the station is still there, but uh, whereas this area was um, uh, more for hookers and for, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to be there at uh, 10 o'clock in the evening, um, we managed to turn that into a vibrant uh, piece of the city. So it looks like this now. And what you can see is uh, also that whereas we have three main uh, parts, like the lower part here, and then a setback for the second part, and then again a setback for the last part. But we also have these balconies and boxes that are attached to the facade. That way you can hardly see that these are three volumes. It's more like a, um, 
like uh, more uh, natural, uh, like people have carved out their own living. Here you see how the tram, how the buses uh, turn here, and the trams they come out. So you can imagine that when we were engineering this project, uh, we had lots of discussions with the uh, bus driving association and with the tram driving association because they didn't want to have the columns here. But we had to carry a building, so we had to move with the columns until uh, everything fitted. And um, the result was that uh, we could only carry on these columns, we could only carry two stories. That's why we had to push back this part of the building, because under this line, there was more uh, solid support for the building. And from there, we could cantilever out on higher floors. Uh, so this is uh, the load of this part of the building is carried by these columns going straight. Here you see the uh, crazy assignment, because this is the station uh, with two um, platforms and then the metro. Here is the bus, and the bus has to cross the metro as well. So they are very anxious that the tram, the metro driver, and the bus driver can see each other. So we had to move the columns. Uh, uh, yeah, where are they? We will see them later. This is the second floor. Uh, where you have commercial spaces. This is meant to be a restaurant, cafe, but the market last year was not particularly good, so it's uh, empty still. Uh, maybe, I, I haven't been there in a couple of months, so maybe last summer uh, they finally found someone. Uh, there's a fitness here, and also um, uh, e-sports uh, facility. And these are the uh, apartments, so you see a corridor type, with uh, two elevators here and stairs, very simple, integrated in the building, and then uh, this courtyard, semi-courtyard uh, type uh, with, uh, with yeah, gardens around. So here you see the drawing, the section. Uh, the, the courtyard type is much lower than the rest of the building which creates this uh, attractive uh, garden on the roof. These are the sections. So here you see, for example, a column here, which supports that beam, that column, which is uh, perpendicular, not uh, perpendicular, it's shallow. And uh, here you see the truss that supports the whole building uh, going up. It was really complicated to make this. And here you see the foundations and the pillars. Uh, in the Netherlands, almost everywhere, you have to use pillars to uh, support the building. So the tram, and, uh, met the tram and the bus, they were in this space. And then we had to cantilever this uh, floor, the terrace, which required a separate uh, structure. Here also you see this uh, strange column going down. And um, yeah, this is under construction. So you see the, the first uh, part, the floor of the commercial spaces, uh, two floors high. Then uh, building it, <laughs> finding room for the for the hoist, for the crane, uh, was really difficult, uh, but it was positioned here and in the middle of the project. This is the place for the workers. And here you see that um, we had to finish the lower part of the building before the trial for the metro started because they used, I think, three quarters of a year to do test driving with a metro, and we were not allowed to, um, uh, to create a delay there. So it really was a race against the time to get up uh, in time. 
Here you see the construction, uh, the building site of the biggest uh, uh, bicycle parking in uh, Europe. And uh, that was taking place at the same time. This is our building on the left. So uh, it was really a challenge. And when you think about a cantilever, when you, make, uh, when you draw this, when you think of it, you easily make a line, looks nice. How is the volume? Uh, what kind of space does it create? But in the end, I really admire the people, who, uh, uh, the daredevils that uh, make that kind of uh, structure. So here we are already a bit further. And here also the facade is beginning to take shape. Um, what you can see here, uh, what I didn't think of, we only had this very small part here uh, where we touched the ground. But it also means that uh, the sewage system, the rainwater uh, pipes, the uh, heat and cold pipes for the um, uh, heating and cooling of the building, that's uh, urban heating and cooling. Um, they all had to move from everywhere to this location where they would go in a shaft and then uh, under the ceiling and then go down to the street. So uh, here you see that uh, we had to change the, uh, the beams in such a way that we create a space for these um, for these pipes here. So that's also quite challenging for engineering. And if you go up uh, through the shafts, you also had a lot of pipes. And you can imagine that uh, when you have uh, heat recovery on the roof, it means that your air uh, goes in and it goes out on the roof. And that means that if you have a shift in the volume of your building, that the pipes have to, have to go like that. That was one of the craziest uh, things that we have to solve. So here you see how these uh, pipes, how they cross, how they are uh, here. They use the same space where we uh, reduce the size of the, um, of the beams. Uh, here you see a couple of uh, joints. The joints were prefabricated and then bolted on site to the beams. And you can see how big they were. These are a lady's uh, hand. And these are the commercial spaces where we had uh, steel, um, uh, corrugated steel and uh, concrete uh, floor. You see the uh, stability uh, crosses. And uh, of course, then you, you can bolt this, but uh, it doesn't mean that you solve all the uh, fire uh, protection issues. Therefore, they were all clad by uh, gypsum, and then they start looking a bit like this. So it's very strange sculptures that uh, live in your building. Um, here is also an interesting case. We had this uh, span for the bridge, and uh, the, the beams were simply t calculated too high. So we had to, um, if we simply would follow the proposal of the engineer, we would have a, a beam going like that. Uh, but then we proposed to uh, put it on the upside um, and a shorter part. And this also works. So I uh, show you. Later here, you see that uh, we turned it into uh, a bench on the bridge. So some details. Um, it's basically, um, uh, I forgot the name. Um, it's not balloon frame, but uh, something like that. Uh, uh, wooden. Um, girders and uh, gypsum board and underlayment together with uh, insulation in it and then of course the uh, window frames the gardens the balustrade 
and uh, aluminium uh, facade. Uh, maybe you wonder why we use aluminium, because that uh, takes a lot of energy to make it. But uh, this building, uh, the structure was so critical that we had to choose a lightweight facade. And then aluminium, uh, nobody can beat aluminium. Here you see for the balconies, we had this uh, steel uh, girders and um, we attached consoles and uh, also here with uh, uh, wooden girders uh, we created this uh, low uh, weight um, floor with a decking and uh, this is the balustrade. Small balcony but because you have sliding doors you can connect them to your uh, room. The patterns on the facade, we worked on the different skills to uh, translate the, um, the, the uh, design uh, principles on the largest scale, like shifting the blocks and uh, then add the boxes for the balconies, etc. Uh, we translated them into patterns uh, on the facade. So here uh, you see a test uh, mock-up and also this uh, ferro-cement element uh, when you go down with aluminum uh, to the ground floor it's very vulnerable to, um, uh, yeah, to vandalism and therefore uh, we use um, ferro-cement on that location. So this is a ferro-cement element you see it looks almost the same as the aluminium aluminium and here you can also see that uh, uh, how the facade is connected to the building this is in the end how it looks so you see that uh, the structure is still visible um, the windows uh, are uh, integrated in the design. Uh, you have a nice uh, ceiling um, and this is all affordable housing, like it's uh, below 1100 euros uh, per month. And you see here, this is an uh, emergency exit, this uh, stair. We continued it to the roof because there we also have, a, we need an emergency exit, but um, this way it also invites you to walk to the roof, to the garden, enjoy the view and uh, don't use the elevator uh, going up. So it looks like this in the evening. In the background the, large, uh, the largest uh, uh, bicycle parking. And that's uh, what I wanted to tell you. So if you have any questions, yes, please. I think it's not on the it's, yeah. how's it going to be transported to the how is it going to be transported to the site because it's yeah. 90 meters okay um so my question was about the aquatic center project yeah you said the roof is 90 meters uh, long. Yeah. I was wondering how is how is it going to be transported to the site? Yeah. I had uh, many, uh, I had so many slides that I had to uh, remove that one. Yeah. But it's a very good question. Um, it's actually um, there are two joints uh, at one third, so uh, that reduces the size, the dimension <laughs> to 30 meters, 40 meters and uh, they are bolted together. But there is no steel in the girder. It's uh, really, um, really wood. It's laminated wood. 
other questions? Sorry. So it really is just timber, that piece? Yeah, it's all timber. I thought it must be t a wire in the middle no, of no, it. No, 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 it's timber, yeah. Okay. People keep asking that, but uh, yeah. it's really timber, yeah. Um, Hiya. Uh, my question, really quickly, is... Um, your piece earlier around the town or city planning and planning for the future. Yeah. And it really concerns the question of density and pressure on services. Mm -hmm. So if we're creating this, ideally this 15 minute city, um, how do you envisage the issues of density um, sort of creeping into um, issues affecting the trains and things like that, where just the sheer population and the number of people living within that small vicinity is actually causing the issue. Um, how has that thought yeah. process happened? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's a very good question. Um, the idea, uh, the way we use the 15-minute city, and that's why I showed the example, um, where you have this more or less one square kilometer area and then four hubs. It's a bit theoretical model, but uh, can also be six hubs. But the idea is that um, you don't uh, think about mobility as I have my car, it's parked in front of my door. I step in and I go to where I want to be and park it in front of the door there. That model is passé. Also in the Netherlands, the uh, the planners uh, at the ministerial level, they uh, agree this is no longer feasible. So uh, we're now starting to think of chain mobility, which means that uh, the first bit, well, if you go to your Google Maps and you uh, uh, say, I wanna go there and give directions, um, if you uh, choose the option to take public transport, there's always like walk five minutes in this direction and then uh, take that metro and then uh, at that station take the high speed train uh, and then again take the bus and uh, if you combine that with uh, cycling but also private car options or car sharing system op options uh, then you get chain mobility. And the chain mobility uh, in the example of the microcity, what I ch showed, is that um, you, you arrive at your neighborhood, not at your doorstep, you arrive at your neighborhood. And uh, if you want to go somewhere else from your neighborhood, you go to the hub and pick whatever you want to pick. But it's mobility as a service and not so much mobility as ownership. And that's the, the big difference. And it's, it's not different for, um, for uh, people as it is for logistics. Because if you want to reduce uh, emissions or uh, the uh, burden on uh, ecosystems by mobility, you have to, uh, to create systems that allow you to choose the best environmental option. And robots can calculate that for you and uh, give you advice. So uh, there are options, uh, uh, things that are being elaborated now uh, that give you the option, um, do you want to have, uh, like in, in a car, you can choose like, uh, I want to have uh, avoid highways or I want to uh, be as quick as possible. Uh, but you can also, in the future, you can also choose, I want to have the best environmental option. And then uh, the computer calc calculates for you how to do that. So this kind of uh, shift in thinking about uh, accessibility, uh, that is uh, related to these kind of uh, proposals. And if you think about this mobility hub at the neighborhood level, 
it doesn't require an extremely high density because it's only a hub and maybe there are 200 parks, parked cars and there is a bus stop. That's it. So maybe it's good for, um, for a bakery to be there, maybe for a pub, but uh, that's it. But if this hub by any chance is Oxford Circus, it's different, you know? So the, the density issue is very much related to the position in the network. If you are at a central point in the network, you will really get the platform, uh, the last project that I showed you. That's really the high density thing, but it's the busiest node of the Netherlands where all the trains uh, one moment or later will come. So that's uh, where the property value is also highest. So that's where the pressure on real estate is the highest. Is this clear? No? Okay. Any more questions? Well, I've got, I've just got one, one more question. Firstly, I just want to thank you for, for such a nice talk and also such an optimistic talk. My, I suppose my question refers to some of the slides you showed earlier uh, about sort of the sort of local neighborhood and the kind of mix. Do you think we have any hope in this country with land ownership and, and our planning system and all the rest of it in, to actually get, let's say, light industry or small-scale industry back into or closer into town? Because it, it always gets pushed, even in industrial parks, they, they, get, they get cleaned up and it gets pushed further and further, you know, people making things or doing anything like physical that makes a noise or whatever. So I just, I, I, I love the idea of what you're talking about. I just, I, I just, I just, I just love to see it. Maybe it is happening, but I just. Um, this afternoon we were talking uh, to a lady who mentioned Preston as an example with a different uh, policy, uh, which was really a big stimulus for the local economy. Um, I think the reason why I showed this uh, financial stuff is because um, I know that uh, it's not just architects and artists who are thinking about a better world. Uh, it's really mainstream now. And um, for example, uh, pension funds in the Netherlands, they are pushed to rethink their investment. So. Uh, one after the other, they're turning green. They're looking for green investment. What is green investment? It's not there. So some of them even invest in um, weapons uh, manufacturers, you know? So it's, it's a lot of greenwashing there. But I think we've had, uh, we're, we're at a pivotal point where this changes and we don't accept it anymore. We, uh, we want accountability. If we spend one trillion from the EU for a green uh, investment, and also the US and probably the UK as well, then there will be reporting demands uh, that require that uh, investments are really green. And then um, the system changes. If the system changes, it's much easier to realize things. But it's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. <laughs> but maybe, uh, maybe we're getting there. And I, as an architect, you cannot be cynical. You cannot be negative. You cannot be uh, ironic. Uh, for me, that's long past that, uh, that 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 was a solution. So um, if we think, if we have the analysis that it's the cities where we have to solve the problems. The cities are at the moment, like 60% of the world population lives in cities and the cities produce 60, 60, 60 to 70% of all emissions and waste and methane and you, you name it. So, uh, the politicians are not going to solve it. The investors, they don't, they don't have a clue. We are um, the ones who know how cities work. 
So we have to come up with solutions and we have to find the language to explain it to politicians and to investors. So I th in my opinion, that's part of our profession now. ask about how people fit into the circular economy, different kinds of people. I know this is quite a taboo subject in a way, but you know, if somebody has a family of two children or somebody has a family of seven children, which is more sustainable if, if people are going to be living in one bedroom flats or studios in the city, which is more sustainable um, if, if workers are going to have a a shower on the building site while the building is being built, they're given extra extra points I understand in the carbon zero kind of metrics. So how do how people fit into these metrics are something that quite interests me. I noticed that the, the hookers weren't part of the sustainability uh, kind of, they were considered unsustainable and I thought, well, they, they're quite recyclable. Maybe they're fairly sustainable. I don't know. So <laughs> just wondering what you think about, about people in all of this and why they get left out. Sorry. I think, um, I think what, is, uh, what is important about um, our current way of thinking is that if we have um, problems in our economy, we, everybody begins with a recipe of, uh, well, you have to um, export more. And how can you export more? You have to cut wages, because that's the way to move forward. And um, this is the, the uh, basic global globalist economic model. And I think that uh, the circular economy has the potential to transform that model into an ecosystems model, where, which is based on uh, developing local economies. And if you are able to develop local economies, then you can create wealth in your neighborhood. And especially if you are able to, um, to um, to make everybody productive in his own way. So um, if you are 85, maybe you're a pensionado in the current system. If you're 66, you're a pensionado in the current system. But in a micro city, in a 15 minute city, there are so many things that you can do. And if you are a small kid, uh, there are so many things you can do. And if that wealth which is created remains in the neighborhood, then you can gradually grow. And this, is a, this could be a model for Lagos. This could be a model for Mumbai. This could be a model for London. But uh, it requires a rethinking and, and focus on the urban aspects of the circular economy, as I showed. Because everybody's talking about uh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, it has to be recycled. But how and where? And how, who makes the profit? And can we do it without trucks? Uh, what can we do if we are better interconnected at the neighborhood level? Can we do it with uh, uh, digitization? Or can we do it by simply walking and uh, talking to each other? I think there's another aspect to it uh, everybody's talking about wealth, but uh, Netherlands is extremely wealthy, but 50% 50 50 of the people living in cities are depressed. Probably here it's not much different, because their people are no longer in the streets, no longer meeting other people. So it, especially kids, they grow up behind a computer. Uh, so it's, uh, maybe here it's a little bit better than in the Netherlands, but now that I tell it, but I don't know too much about it. But uh, the principle is that um, instead of uh, being productive in a neighborhood uh, where all the wealth which is produced is extracted by Amazon, by Coca-Cola, by uh, you name it, um, think that that wealth which is created remains in the neighborhood and creates a, 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 a iterative development, a positive spiral uh, to create wealth in the neighborhood. 
and there, there are many. I talk a lot with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, with uh, Arcadis, with you know all these uh, large corporations, and there are so many young people that are really uh, they want to make a change, and this is the kind of models they are looking at. If we cannot solve the crisis in the world if we only have a solution for London, if we only have a solution for Manhattan. No, it's, we have to find solutions that work everywhere. If we don't solve the poverty crisis in, uh, in Sri Lanka, they will shoot the last tigers, you know? So it's simply like that. Thank, thank you so much, John. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome.